Hi all. I had a very interesting game last night playing away at Hamill Hansted. I was playing Kay Williamson, who's ECF 181, so not too far from my own rating, which is currently 188. I kicked off with Knight F3, and he played Knight C6. I thought this is a bit of a tricky, unusual move to meet, but um, I played C4 anyway, just trying to you know establish control on D5. And after E5, I just played Knight C3. And after g6, I thought, well, why can't I play a quick d4 here? Wouldn't that give me a slight advantage just to open up the position a bit here? Um, so after e takes, knight takes, he played bishop g7, which gave me my, my first dilemma very early in the game, that do I really want to play knight takes c6? Well, that would be doubling his pawns. You know, maybe if he takes uh, with the b pawn, you know, he'll have rook b8 later, and this diagonal might be quite useful to him. If he takes with a D pawn it's still not so clear even if I you know take his queen off, king takes, um, you know, it wouldn't be that clear because he'd have control of D five with the double pawn. That pawn on C six would be contesting D five. So I actually didn't want to play knight C six, but maybe, you know, objectively it is it is a good move. I played instead E three. Um just supporting the knight, blocking in my own bishop, but on the other hand the bishop can later come out maybe so b3 and bishop b2 to, or a3 later. Well, that's what I thought at the time. But um, after knight f6, bishop e2, um, I decided actually yeah, I don't want to play too slowly with g3 and bishop g2. I've just weakened the light score anyway, f3, by playing e3. So I'll just move bishop e2, and maybe later bishop f3, uh, to put more pressure on d5. The problem with that, though, is that there's knight e5s hitting the bishop quite easily when it's on f3. It's easier to put it on g2, bearing down on d5, without the hassles of knight e5. But anyway, after castling, um, he, I castled, and actually he took on d4 here. So this bishop doesn't have to go here or here. It can now go to g5. And he played uh, d5, so it's kind of bit groomfield -ish, um and I thought he might leave me a nice late queen's pawn now. But in fact, after bishop g5, he played uh, c6, a bit passive maybe. Um, but it does mean that there's a symmetrical pawn structure coming up. Um, after cd, cd, uh, does it you know look as though I'm going to get any advantage here with this um, pawn structure symmetry? Uh, that's the question. Um, well, the slight symmetry is is uh, changed here because of his fianchetto. Um, so I've got potential dark squared weaknesses to try and exploit. Um, but first of all, I want to put a bit more pressure on d5. So I play bishop f3, and he defends with bishop e6. So maybe my pieces are slightly better here. This bishop is slightly better than that one. Uh, this bishop maybe. Um, well, it's it's pinning the knight at the moment and putting more pressure on d5. So maybe I've got a slight advantage here. And I play queen d2, so I, I'm giving myself more options now. Queen f4, or to ex exchange off the bishops. I know it looks a bit crude, this move, queen d2, but it's, again, positionally motivated. You know, central control as well, potentially, with queen f4. You know, putting pressure on these squares. So queen d7, in fact, I do play queen f4 here. And I'm, I was thinking, you know, maybe knight e8, because then he can follow him with f6, and maybe even g5, trying to win a piece. Um, so that gets a bit hairy there. But uh, actually, he played knight e4. Uh, well, let's see, what would I have played with knight e8? I was actually considering stuff like rook e1, and if f6, rook e6, with the idea of queen e6, bishop d5. But um, we were looking a bit at this after the game, and unfortunately, in this kind of position, if... If I don't protect the rook, well, I can actually protect the rook, but if I try and win the pawn, then there's rook takes f3. So that, that would break that tactic of bishop takes d5. So that's no good. So, But, but I think this might be play, playable anyway, um, rook e1. But I don't want to get too much into that. He played knight e4, and it's still got some ideas of playing f6, so I wanted to rule out the f6 ideas. I played actually bishop takes e4, so I'm giving away my light square bishop, giving away the two bishops. A bit controversial, I know, but I'm, I've got in mind bishop f6 to clamp down on black playing f6. And to my delight, he took on f6, and now I'm really staring these dark squares in the face with the queen. 
And that's something, you know, about this game. I, I keep the queen on these dark squares. So rook a d8, rook a d1, protecting my d-pawn. The knight might be better than the bishop, especially the way he plays his bishop now. A bit um, kamikaze into my position. Bishop c4, and he parks the bishop on d3. Um, but I think it's almost a tactical liability because of things like f3. Um, but he's got in mind uh, ideas of, like, queen f5, perhaps. Um, so if takes, then he's supporting that bishop. And I don't know, it, it seems a bit dodgy, this, this idea, because f3 is a potential threat all the time. But I didn't really... Um, well, why didn't I play f3 here, you might be, might be thinking. Uh, I think, actually, there was queen... Maybe queen d4 was a possibility. But then takes, 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 and the bishop's and pre... But it's protected then by the rook. So I didn't think it was that clear anyway. I wanted to keep the queen eyeing g7. So what I did was actually d5. Because I've got a different idea here now. So I'm, I want to you know, keep the suspension going, su suspense going around f3. I want to keep the queen in a nice place eyeing these dark squares. So I play now queen d4 after you play queen f5. And... Here, actually, the idea of f3 is starting to backfire, because takes, rook takes, he'll have f2 check, and if queen takes, then queen takes d3. So I've got a different idea now, though, altogether than f3, and I switch to this idea, which is d6. So I want to activate the knight to start eyeing, you know, these squares, so knight d5 and knight, creates really massive threats against his king. And here, if rook e5 or queen e5, then I, I just... Well, if rook e5, I've got rook takes d3. And then I'll be winning material. You know, takes, then rook takes e5. Well, if queen e5, I take, then rook e5, then rook takes d3. So he's under pressure here, and he goes for my d-pawn, and I slip in this move knight d5 now, nevertheless. And I'm winning material. Because after rook d takes d6, I wonder if you can spot my next move if I give you five seconds from here. Starting from now. Okay, I hope you spotted it. I played knight e7, delightfully winning the exchange. So I've managed to convert a tiny little advantage of, um, you know, that difference in symmetrical pawn structures of, of the Fianchetto into dark square weaknesses, which is now being converted into being the exchange up for a pawn. But it's, it's no longer a pawn after this next move, rook e6. I play check and nab his a7 pawn. Knowing I can get back, and I'm also protecting f2. I can get back to d4 if necessary with check. So it started to look like plain sailing here at this point in the game. I'm the exchange up. A pure exchange up, not for any pawns. And my queen can reroute now to the centre again. So queen d7. Preventing rook f6 unless he wants the queen exchange. So he plays queen f4. And it sets a nifty trap, actually, this. <coughs> based on the back row. That after the check, king g8... I, I can't play rook takes d3 here, trying to win his queen, because it'll be rook e1. Um, and, sorry, in the previous position, before I'd gone there, I couldn't play rook takes d3, ed, rook takes e6, because of queen c1. So my bet row's weak in a nutshell. So I've got to be wary about that. Instead, I just play rook c1. So I'm threatening my own mating threats again with rook c8. And it's here he offers the exchange of queens. So it looks as though it's plain sailing. I'm, I'm switching my mode of thinking now. It's an end game. Pawns have got to be pushed. That's the thing. Got to start the squeeze with the pawns. So here, um, my first idea, though, is, is to try and have the potential to double up rooks if I need to, to play rook c6. So actually, I play rook c3, and now it's the, the, pawn, the time for pawns. I play a4. And it's already, you know, playing a useful fixing role, this. You know, if b5 I'd take and then take on e4. So I'm starting to fix that b6 pawn. And he's starting to march his pawns down on the other side, rather dramatically. But I've got in mind now b5 and rook c6 to try and gain a tempo. You know, if he wants to avoid the exchange of rooks, he'll lose b6. So this happens. So his position is starting to be really critical, because I'm going to get two connected past pawns now. On the queen side. And it's here, I, actually, I did hallucinate. I thought, for some reason, rook a1 was not possible because of takes. 
a rook a4, bishop b5. But of course, I don't need to play rook b6 and go into it a weird, you know, an ending. I can just play rook c4 and be a rook up, and that's that's clearly winning. Um, so rook a1 is perfectly playable, and I'm just I'm just going to win his b6 pawn next. He plays f5. I take on b6 and f4, and now his last resource is he's trying to generate this this pass pawn. Uh, for the moment, I didn't see the problem, but now I, I'm starting to, to worry a bit in this position because I'm thinking, well, especially here, I play rook c1 thinking this is great. I, I can go for his king with rook c7 and mate him potentially, but not only blocks it with bishop c4 now, I'm starting to be rudely awakened by the possibilities of e2 and rook d1.